Well, we're gonna get started then. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Bartow History Museum's April Lunch and Learn. My name is Trey Gaines. I'm the museum director and we're glad to have you all out with us to join us this afternoon. Let me go over a few, uh, few things before we begin. We are recording today's lecture and it will be available on the members portal of our website uh, soon, one day next week. We are, uh, Dr. Player has uh, agreed to take questions and if you'll hold on to those questions till the end of the presentations, we'll, we'll, we'll call for those. Um, our next uh, evening lecture will be next Thursday at seven o'clock here on Zoom with members of the Bartow County Genealogical Society joining us to talk more about how to research your family roots. If you're a runner, don't forget that our History Hustle 5K will occur a week from Saturday on uh, May 1st. Registration for that event can be found on our website. The museum is open Monday through Saturday, 10 to five. Uh, we encourage you to come out and join us and see the museum uh, and, and stop by the museum gift shop if you're looking for gift ideas. And all of this information about our upcoming programs and events can be found on our website at bartohistorymuseum.org. Well, we're pleased to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Tiffany Player. Dr. Player is completing her first year as an assistant professor of history at Georgia State University. She received her PhD in history from Washington University in St. Louis. She has received a warm welcome from her students, GSU colleagues and members of the greater Atlanta community and looks forward to making new connections. She's a native of New Orleans and coming back to the South has been a dream come true. Dr. Player is a historian of identity formation and the attendant political and social transformations of communities within the African diaspora during slavery and after emancipation. She is currently working on her book project tentatively titled, What Are We Going to Do for Ourselves? African-American Women and the Politics of Slavery from the Antebellum Era to the Great Depression, which analyzes black women's efforts to force a public reckoning with the material and cultural legacies of slavery in the United States as an essential component of their political power across multiple generations. Today's presentation on the Negro Building and the 1895 Atlanta Exposition is part of this larger project. Dr. Player, welcome. We're glad to have you here today and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I look forward to participating in a fruitful and engaging conversation about the politics of slavery that animated African-American activism after the Civil War. I want to thank especially um, Joshua Graham for inviting me to share my work with you. And I'd like to thank Lisa Romans and Trey and Lauren and Sarah um, and the entire Bartow History Museum staff for making my talk possible. Okay, thank you so much for, um, for having me here. I really do look forward to having a good conversation about the politics of slavery that animated African-American activism after the Civil War. Um, and I look forward to kind of engaging with questions um, after my presentation. Um, so I am going to share my screen for a little bit. And that's where I ran into trouble last time. So hopefully take two will be um, much better. So let's do this. Okay. All right. The existence of the WPA narratives and the presence of an ex-slave public in this nation from the 1850s to the 1930s has led me to reconsider this transformational period in US and African-American history through an interpretive lens I have called the politics of slavery. That expansive term captures the contested meanings, persistent structural inequalities, deliberate engagements, and perhaps most importantly, the calculated silences about the real and imagined experiences of slavery and its impact on African-American communities. For these reasons, I argue, the politics of slavery could only begin after the Confederacy's defeat in the Civil War, when Black and white Americans struggled to adapt to a world transformed by the emancipation of 4 million people. Constructing a politics of slavery 
afforded Black women activists in particular a great deal of flexibility in framing their concerns about labor, political participation, citizenship, poverty, and their experiences with violence. My presentation today foregrounds African-American women's efforts to define the legacy of slavery as a prerequisite for securing meaningful and lasting reform in the United States. For many, the legacies of slavery, fighting over that, defining that, took center stage during the 1895 Cotton States and International Exposition. From September 18th to December 31st, 1895, the city of Atlanta hosted the Cotton States and International Exposition to showcase the resources of the Cotton States and to stimulate trade with Spanish American countries. Its success rested upon rebranding the region as progressive and modern, a transformation that included defining the place of African Americans without slavery. In the 30 years since General Sherman's infamous march to the sea during the Civil War, Atlanta had transformed itself from a fledgling agrarian economy into an exemplar of post-war Southern industrial capitalism. The city's African-American population exploded after the Civil War as ex-slaves fled plantations for better employment opportunities and to assert their identities as American citizens. By 1895, Black Southerners made up 40% of the city's 75,000 residents. Atlanta indeed offered grand possibilities for the new Negro. The city was home to the largest concentration of institutions of higher education for African-Americans and numerous businesses thrived within the city. Segregation laws and racial violence, however, also defined the spatial and cultural boundaries of post-emancipation life in Atlanta. Within a decade, Georgia had passed a series of laws that not only compelled train and streetcar operators to police passengers, but also began codifying segregation in restaurants, hotels, and other public areas. By the time the Cotton States and International Exposition opened on September 18, 1895, Georgia had already recorded the deaths of eight Black lynching victims. Nevertheless, Black and white boosters heavily promoted the creation of a Negro building as a signature feature of the Cotton Exposition. The Paris Exposition had its Eiffel Tower, the Chicago's World Fair had its Ferris wheel, but Atlanta would have its Negro building, one observer remarked. With the Negro building, white moderates boasted, we have taken the children of our former slaves and given them an equal chance with our own sons and daughters. Critics of a separate Negro building wondered aloud whether white fairgoers would actually permit African Americans to be treated as American citizens at the Atlanta Fair. But supporters of the Negro building insisted, however, that a separate pavilion would provide the spatial integrity for displaying the race's progress and for discussing issues of special concern to African Americans. They argued, the exhibits of Negro progress would not be huddled in a corner or scattered across a hundred different buildings um, on the Piedmont fairgrounds as at other world's fairs, but it would be put together in a spacious and elegant building. The Cotton States Exposition Program credited exhibition organizers for seizing the opportunity of a lifetime by securing $200,000 in federal funds, roughly $6.3 million in uh, today's money for, Atlanta, for the Atlanta Fair, a portion of which would go to the Negro Building. 
While African Americans had already created their own commemorative calendar of emancipation celebrations, local Black history and culture programs, and colored state fairs, the Cotton States Exposition marked the first time that they were invited to participate in a major world's fair. African Americans were in charge of constructing the building, curating the exhibits, organizing the events, and hosting scores of Black visitors who traveled to the city for the momentous occasion. An editorial featured in the Atlanta Constitution section devoted to Black community interests summed up the enormous stakes of the Negro building. Quote, its success is our success, its success is the South's success, and we being part of the South, we must succeed with it or fail with it. African Americans control over the exhibition space inside the Negro building only heightened the stakes for showcasing what the race had achieved with but 30 years of freedom. And that was a common phrase that was bandied about in 1895, you know, this 30 years of freedom since um, the end of the Civil War and the abolition of slavery. Those charged with curating the exhibits had to decide how to apportion the building's 25,000 square foot interior between representing the capabilities of the Negro race on the one hand and showcasing from whence we came, the slavery past on the other. And these two competing impulses defined post-emancipation Black political culture at the end of the 19th century. Devoting considerable space to showing from whence we came, the slavery past, would have required putting the violence and trauma experienced by enslaved people and their descendants on display for public consumption. At a time when many white Americans from the South and from the North publicly questioned whether emancipation had been a mistake, organizers understood that the material culture of the Negro building needed to show African Americans as productive citizens. For these reasons, the Negro building did not contain bills of sale, pictures of the slave auction block, slave narratives, or slavery era weapons used to terrorize enslaved people. In doing so, the organizers pushed the violent exploitation of formerly enslaved men, women, and children to the margins of a carefully curated story of Negro progress. While the world outside of the pavilion, the city of Atlanta, the South, and many other parts of the country moved toward stricter segregation of the races in the 1890s, for 100 days in 1895, the exhibition of the Negro building became one of the most integrated spaces at the Cotton States exhibition. The exhibition's chief architect designed the Negro building in the same neo-Romanesque style as other buildings at the fair, and it was built by two Black contractors. This first national panorama of Negro progress measured 112 feet wide by 260 feet long and housed 25,000 square feet of exhibits from schools, businesses, and organizations around the country. Rounded arches over dozens of windows let in lots of natural light. Visitors could walk up a 70 foot tower located in the center of the building and stand on a platform made of Georgia pine wood to get an impressive open air view of the exhibition fairgrounds. Smaller towers posted at the corners of the building and two additional towers flanking the main entrance created an impressive structure that complemented the aesthetic of the other pavilions. The Negro building's location, however, was far away from other state exhibits and from the women's building, which was also a new um, kind of building at the exhibi exhibition. This first museum of black culture and progress 
was located on Jackson Street in the southeastern corner of the Piedmont Fairgrounds and was flanked on either side by the Midway Heights, which was kind of like an amusement um, center, and the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show Grandstand, which was also a popular amusement spot. This dubious placement encouraged a blurred distinction of the Negro building as both a monument to Black progress and a novelty for curiosity seekers. As a result, the building's progressive curatorial aesthetic competed with the commercial popularity of the old plantation and living slave exhibits that depicted more familiar images of Black subjection on the 189 acre fairgrounds of Piedmont Park. But Black leaders framed their control of the Negro building as a boon for Black industry. Three hotels located on West Mitchell, Houston, and Jackson Streets were located in close proximity to the exhibition grounds. Penn assured Black travelers and white organizers that visiting the Atlanta Fair would be that Black visitors visiting Atlanta would be assigned their abodes before arriving in the city. Additionally, the Negro Building would house a restaurant that Boosters touted as an exhibit in itself of how a colored man could make colored people comfortable. Although white fairgoers also had a public comforts department to facilitate traveling to and from the fair, Georgia's status as a Jim Crow state placed prodigious responsibility on the Negro board of trying to make an enjoyable experience for African-Americans who could afford to visit the fair. The Atlanta fair has now become synonymous with Booker T. Washington's opening day speech in which the Tuskegee Institute founder articulated a complex politics of slavery that counseled black Southerners to exercise patience in their great leap from slavery to freedom. And he encouraged them to quote, cast down your buckets where you are. For months, Irving Garland Penn, the head of the Negro Board of Commissioners, which was a group of 12 black leaders charged with overseeing the Negro building, had been pushing the white led exhibition board to have a black speaker on opening day. Despite the rhetoric of interracial cooperation, wealthy businessmen like Charles Collier and Samuel Inman really tried to limit black visibility at official fair activities, particularly opening day. And they offered to create a separate dedicatory exercise for African-American fairgoers. But the campaign for a black speaker on opening day really revealed the multiple roles that Penn and other black leaders envisioned for African-Americans at the Cotton States Exposition. Having a black speaker would not only integrate this high profile event on Southern soil, but it would also affirm African-Americans as co-equals in the pursuit of post-emancipation Southern progress and modernity. Penn's personal relationship and esteem for Washington, widely respected as the wizard of Tuskegee, put the Alabama educator at the top of Penn's list of candidates. In his negotiations with Collier, Inman, and the other white leaders of the exhibition board, Penn reminded those powerful white men that African Americans had been instrumental in helping to secure that $200,000 worth of federal funds um, from congressmen in Washington, D.C. On this issue, Penn really tested white organizers' public commitment to interracial cooperation at the Cotton States Exhibition. And he told Washington that he was either going to get his name on the principal program or he was going to make uh, exhibition leaders um, give him a flat out refusal. The board agreed to extend an invitation to Washington and did so on August 24th, 1895. When Penn sent his congratulations to Washington, he expressed relief and victory. We have verily fought a 
good fight. When Booker T. Washington issued his Atlanta Compromise speech, he did so in front of a predominantly white audience, and he didn't deliver the speech inside the Negro building. Washington was the only African-American speaker inside the auditorium on opening day. A few black spectators were allowed, including Penn and the rest of the Negro Board of Commissioners, but they had to sit in the section of the auditorium that white organizers had reserved for the use of colored people. Despite the indignities of segregated seating, Black exhibition leaders viewed Washington's invitation to speak on opening day as a huge coup. With the 15 minutes allotted, Washington dreamed out loud about ex-slaves learning new crafts at Black institutions such as Tuskegee, and eventually parlaying those skills they had honed during the era of slavery into economic independence. And he publicly dismissed calls for social and political equality as, quote, the extremist folly. Washington's avoidance of such controversial topics as lynching and disenfranchisement garnered considerable praise from white audiences. The vision he articulated on opening day eschewed demands for political rights in favor of economic uplift. But it is important to understand that his was only one of the many positions espoused by African-Americans at the Atlanta Fair. African-American women, the dozens of, best, of the best of Black womanhood in Atlanta met in the National Congress of Negro Women. And for more than 200 Black women representing local clubs, from 26 states in the District of Columbia, they came together for two days in December for fellowship and political conferencing and to witness the nation's first Negro building before the Cotton States and International Exposition closed down forever. Clad in full, dress, full length dresses, perfectly coiffed hairstyles and elaborate hats, these members of the educated elite epitomized the new Negro woman. And their gathering marked the first organized meeting of African-American women at a US World's Fair. Entangled within their confident diagnosis of the problems that African-Americans faced in 1895, their self-assured prescriptions for race advancement evidenced a complex ambivalence about the legacy of slavery and a nagging uncertainty about how ex-slaves and their poor, ill-educated descendants might fit into a modernizing American society. For two days, these self-possessed race women outlined a bold and progressive platform that supported women's suffrage and universal education, identified the key components of stable Black households, denounced lynching in the convict lease system as dehumanizing, and defended the moral character of Black women. The National Congress of Colored Women passed resolutions against the separate car and urged transportation company officials to adopt a first and second class fare to help protect the womanhood of the race. African-American women were also often times relegated to the Negro car, the smoking car, um, in which lower class men um, and men of all classes would smoke. This was a, a dirtier um, kind of uh, car in, um, on these trains. And these African-American women who were part of the educated elite classes were really you know, kind of dismayed and outraged that they simply because of their race were relegated to this kind of subordinate, poorly vent ventilated um, car on trains, even if they could pay a first class fare. The National Congress of Negro Women also petitioned Democratic legislators who were in the process of um, crafting laws that would disenfranchise Black men, but they petitioned them against doing so. These activists demonstrated just how far African-Americans 
at least those who had shared their exceptional claims to education, refinement, and money had advanced in the 30 years since the abolition of slavery. Deploying the politics of uplift and respectability that was popular among the educated middle class, these participants in the National Congress of Colored Women declared that slavery had marred the past, but not the Negro future. Bethel AME Church was the ideal location for this gathering of elite Black women. The church had long functioned as a center of African-American religious, political, and cultural expression, and was often called Sweet Auburn City Hall since it was the largest meeting space for African-Americans in the city of Atlanta. Its location at 220 Auburn Avenue, three miles from the exhibition fairgrounds at Piedmont Park, gave the Women's Congress an independent space within which to diagnose the problems facing the race and to identify solutions for post-emancipation progress. And I think, you know, what's really important is the fact that these women are advocating um, against lynching and disenfranchisement, that they are able to do so in part because they're in this kind of Black controlled space, whereas Washington is offering his kind of compromise speech um, as, you know, the only African American speaker in the auditorium on opening day. So location mattered. The women who attended this Congress perceived a real lack of progressiveness on the part of African-American male leaders at the turn of the 19th century. And these women, while they often worked independently and sometimes in partnership with their influential husbands to improve the quality of life of Black Americans, they really expressed frustration whenever, quote, the lords of creation, end quote, tried to stymie their political ascendance. Margaret Murray Washington was a principal participant in this National Congress of Colored Women. And when she spoke to this gathering of elite Black women, she really stepped out of the shadow of Tuskegee and her famous husband, Booker T. Washington. The Macon, Mississippi native wielded considerable influence in her own right on issues of race and gender. And she often partnered with her husband to promote ideals of industrial education and domestic training. In her capacity as lady principal of Tuskegee Institute and president of the Tuskegee Women's Club and the president of the National Federation of Afro-American Women, she had demonstrated a deep commitment to building stable and prosperous black families. Living and working in rural Alabama, she organized weekly mother's meetings and domestic training programs for freed women and young girls on the Russell Plantation Settlement, located just a few miles from Tuskegee Institute. Her programs adhered to a bath, broom, and Bible pedagogy that instructed female caretakers on how to cast off the vestiges of slavery by adopting bourgeois and Christian methods of housekeeping, cooking, sewing, and childcare. And part of that process of moving from slavery to freedom included giving educated middle-class women opportunities to try to uplift the plantation woman. The redemption of Black mothers from the degrading legacy of slavery and sexual abuse and aiding them in the creation of stable and respectable households figured prominently in their discussions. The National Congress of Colored Women identified the characteristics of respectable Black womanhood in the South. These women, elite women, disparaged the one room log cabin that had provided practical and communal support for multiple generations of ex-slave families as unwholesome and detrimental to both the physical and moral um, capabilities of the race. Instead, they promoted the single family residence because they believed that that kind of structure would promote intelligence, refinement, and morality in the Negro home. 
News that the only eating establishment African Americans could patronize would also sell liquor ignited a firestorm of controversy by the Colored Women's Congress, and these women weighed in on that controversy. They condemned, in the strongest terms, the sale of liquor and all intoxicants. Before the fair, Black club women had warned Penn and the all-male Board of Negro Commissioners that the sale of liquor would really reflect negatively on the race. They feared the presence of Black of drunken black fairgoers, because that presence might lend some credence to stereotypes about African American degeneracy. And they were also deeply concerned about the possibility of drunken white fairgoers who would patronize the Negro building um, and perhaps heighten the specter of violence and sexual assault against black women inside the Negro building which they believed should remain a safe space for Black women on the um, Piedmont fairgrounds. Ultimately, alcohol was served as a fundraising enterprise, and there were no reported incidents inside the Negro building. However, this controversy, and Margaret Murray Washington was one of the leaders um, who articulated the concerns of these women, exposed the level of anxiety that some black fairgoers suffered as they tried to showcase the race's accomplishments during the era of disfranchisement and you know, within the first generation and a half after the abolition of slavery. Although some black leaders viewed the separate Negro building as a capitulation to white supremacy, many more black women and men hoped that a grand showing in the Negro building might be powerful enough to stop Jim Crow and disenfranchisement. Although African-American women were excluded from speaking at opening day and no women served on the board of Negro commissioners, their ideas proved indispensable in the success of the Negro building. They solicited donations, collected and arranged exhibits, organized tours, and dealt with all manner of issues pertaining to the social well-being of Black fairgoers. Virtually all manner of life was represented inside the Negro building. Many of the state exhibits comprised artifacts that demonstrated achievement in the arts, in agricultural sciences, industrial technologies, businesses, and the domestic arts. Industrial training schools such as Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia demonstrated the versatility of black laborers. Tuskegee contributed a cornucopia of material culture that included expertly tailored clothing, wood furniture, boots and shoes, bricks, cabinets, wagons, staircases, bathtubs, you know, just to name a few of the items that they displayed. Um, and these were all items that were made by students in, um, in their training departments. The Virginia display typified the kinds of state exhibits that highlighted African American progress in manufacturing and business. The Grand Fountain United Order of True Reformer Savings Bank in Richmond and Lynchburg um, was described as a benevolent and banking organization owned and controlled by Negroes since 1881. With a membership of 30,000 and um, having paid a benefit, benefits of $850,000 to um, Negro depositors. The artifacts included in these business properties, um, photographs of the homes that these banks helped to finance were also included in these, um, in these exhibits. This is a picture of the exhibit from Washington DC that also featured exhibitions from Howard University in that city. African-Americans frequented the Cotton States Exposition and their presence as organizers and, and participants were important in promoting evidence of race progress. This picture is one of the many African-American women who served as docents to answer questions about exhibits and race progress more generally. 
This woman is representing Alcorn University that contributed items for the Mississippi exhibit. This is a picture of African-American students at Spelman Seminary in Atlanta, later Spelman College. Take a note of the dress of these women as emblematic of the progress of the race. You know, these women are, you know, very, um, um, their decorum, their, the way that they are comporting themselves really was designed to signify um, confidence and femininity, okay, and race progress. The creation of artist W.C. Hill garnered special attention as the most attractive feature in the pavilion. His six foot plaster statue, Chains Broken But Not Off, was featured as part of the District of Columbia's exhibit. And it was mounted on a three foot pedestal and the figure de depicted, quote, a typical Negro, large and muscular, struggling to free himself of the effects of slavery. Black leaders praised this work of colored art artistry and hoped visitors would remember that the race had, quote, by the help of its friends and the dent of its own effort, hewn out for itself no mean consideration in our own America. If it be remembered from whence they came and by what difficulties they are yet surrounded. This is a drawing that was printed in the New York Outlook that depicted President Grover Cleveland's visit to the Negro building. And this was one of the buildings that the president visited on his um, trip to Atlanta. And so you can see by this drawing that the Negro building is, and this is um, in the background um, is a picture of the, or drawing of the chains broken but not off. Um, but you can see here, this is an integrated space, right? President Cleveland um, is speaking presumably to um, I. Garland Penn, the head of the Negro Board of Commissioners. Um, but you can also see women in this picture as well as African-Americans of different social classes. But while the Negro building marked a new level of Black participation in the United States commemorative traditions, the Midway's old plantation exhibit recreated images of Black subjection for the comic relief of white audiences. The return of Aunt Jemima, the mammy caricature that had made her debut selling pancakes at the 1893 Chicago Fair, epitomized white Americans' rejection of this new educated elite um, new Negro. This was particularly an affront, this, um, the, oh, the thriving plantation, the living slave exhibits were particularly an affront to the Colored Women's Congress, who asserted that Black womanhood went beyond the slave mammy. You can see here that the plantation exhibit garnered considerable press in the Atlanta Constitution as a quote unquote truer symbol of black life in the South. And this, you know, these kinds of exhibits were present at the 1876 fair in Philadelphia, at the 1893 Chicago fair, um, and at subsequent world's fairs. It was a really popular kind of venue um, on the Midway. And so African American, the Negro building, the kind of aesthetic and um, kind of curatorial politics that they were trying to put forward are in direct um, competition and in close proximity to these other renditions of African American life that kind of confines them to the status of abject um, enslaved people. For much of the cotton states in international exposition, elite black men and women used the Negro building to control narratives about African-Americans history of enslavement and the race's accomplishments after emancipation. But the Negro building also provided poor ex-slaves with an opportunity to meet together and define their own legacies of slavery. A realization that age and health ailments might prevent them from gathering again likely compelled some to make the journey to Atlanta um, during the exposition. 
the opportunity to witness firsthand and to personally assess what the Negro has done undoubtedly held great appeal. The presence of an older generation of formerly enslaved men and women inside the Negro building imbued this monument to race progress with cultural significance that went beyond what new Negro organizers like I. Garland Penn, like Margaret Murray Washington had intended. Ex-slaves strolled the aisles of the pavilion alongside those who would never completely understand nor fully appreciate the sacrifices that they had endured and the community ties that they had forged within the crucible of human bondage. Within the walls of the Negro building, they joined a community of ex-slaves who affirmed their self-worth in a changing world. Even before the Cotton States Exposition closed on December 31st, 1895, many believed that this exposition had done more for the Negro than anything since emancipation. African-Americans had showcased the race's achievements and had made a compelling case for full participation in American society. Final tallies showed that more than 1 million visitors, black and white, men and women, middle-class and poor, traveled to Atlanta during those three months and many of them toured the Negro building. By that account, the Negro building was a resounding success. For nearly three months, it symbolized what African-Americans had accomplished with but 30 years of freedom. The National Congress of Colored Women helped launch a national Black women's club movement that shaped generations of activism during an era of disenfranchisement. Ex-slaves also used this Black controlled space to assert that their experiences during slavery and after emancipation were essential to African-American reform agendas and to assessing what had and had not been accomplished since 1865. But the popularity of the Negro building proved no antidote to the anti-Black impulses that the Supreme Court codified in its 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson decision, just five months after the Atlanta fair closed. African-Americans' efforts to define the legacy of slavery took on an even greater sense of urgency in this new era of separate and unequal. Thank you. Now I'd like to open it up for, um, for questions, um, comments, um, thoughts about this moment in US and Southern and African American history. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We did have one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, is the Negro building still, still around? What, whatever happened to the building after the fair? So all of the buildings um, that were on the Piedmont Fairgrounds, they were meant to be temporary structures. So this um, structure was destroyed at the end of the fair along with, with the, other, um, the other buildings. Uh, I had a, so sort of a follow-up question to that. You mentioned um, that the, the plantation type exhibits were featured at previous fairs. Mm -hmm. what, what, what happened at subsequent fairs as far as the, the Negro building? Were there other types of iterations of that at other fairs? Yeah, so, so Atlanta was really um, important because it was the first time that a Negro building was at a World's Fair. But, um, and it set kind of a precedent, particularly for fairs that were taking place in the South. So Nashville has um, the next fair in 1897. And they also have a Negro building. Um, and so, you know, anytime a Southern state um, kind of sponsors a fair, then it is almost expected that they would have 
a Negro building because the vast majority of the African-American population still resides in the South, um, more than 90% during this time period, turn of the 20th century. And so there becomes an expectation that there's going to be a separate kind of exhibition um, of African-American um, progress. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I have a question if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, up here in Cartersville, we're uh, just a couple of train stops away from uh, the uh, Atlanta Depot. And it was there's a lot of advertisements from the time about people coming from Chattanooga to Atlanta through this. So I guess, um, have you seen anything about um, uh, women traveling to the expo, or how you know how did that impact things? Um, are are also people from rural areas coming to see it? Is there any writing about that? Yes, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, so, as far as people from rural areas, like um, a lot of the poor ex-slaves who are, you know, kind of um, patronizing the building, are coming from the rural countryside. You also have a sizable number of patrons who are coming from the more educated elite um, classes of African Americans from um, like Northern and Eastern cities, right? And so one of the things that's really interesting, I mean, the train figures so prominently in this um, kind of episode of, of Southern history because um, the Southern Railway Company offers packages for African American um, fairgoers. And they, I mean, and thinking of one in particular that was kind of advertised to African American fairgoers in the Washington DC area. And what they do is they promise African American fairgoers that they are going to be respected going from Washington DC to Atlanta, that they are not going to be, you know, molested, that they're going to be treated with dignity and respect. I mean, all of the things that African Americans have been kind of pushing for um, with, you know, the controversy over the separate car issue. Um, but these are, I mean, the Negro organized, Negro Board of Commissioners organizers are, you know, kind of help working with companies to create these kinds of experiences so that the Black travelers can feel comfortable traveling on trains and coming into a Southern city. And I mean, what happens with these, um, you know, once people disembark at the train depots, there are um, kind of um, carpools or, or wagon pools that will take people to the um, how the hotels that have been erected during the black hotels that have been erected during the Atlanta Fair. They are also um, could be taken to individual homes where people are kind of um, opening up their place, their establishments for a small fee and promising this kind of comfortable dignified experience. And so what's happening during these three months is this kind of coordinated effort to get as many Black people to patronize the fair and to have them do so without um, kind of the quote unquote normal experiences of white supremacy in Atlanta. So that's a really interesting kind of way that um, the white and and black boosters are kind of working together to create this narrative of, of Atlanta and the South as being different from the past. Thank you so much. I love, I love the emphasis on dignity. So that, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another uh, question in the chat. How were any women's movements in general different from what the African-American women were doing at this time? Yeah, so that's a, a good question. So African American women are really kind of focused in on, um, I guess if you could do a kind of broad comparison, African American women um, by and large have a much broader um, kind of capacious understanding of 
rights and citizenship in the United States than do white women's organizations. And um, so the women's building is also kind of a key figure or a key building during this time period. And, you know, a lot of women activists, I mean, particularly in the South, I mean, Black and white women's organizations are deeply fractured by race. So there is not, especially in 1895, any kind of crossover um, or interracial cooperation between black and white women's organizations. That really does kind of change um, in the 19 teens and 1920s. Um, but in 1895, those organizations are, are separate. And many white women's organizations based in the South are deeply um, invested in protecting white supremacy. And so they see kind of white women's power and influence in society as part of protecting a larger regime, regime of, um, of white supremacy in the South. And so this is also the era in which the United Daughters of the Confederacy becomes you know, a huge um, organization in the South it also has chapters in other parts of the country, but it becomes a huge organization. Um, and they also sponsor events in the women's building. And so in the South, you see a lot of um, just explicit attention to issues of race and a very kind of public separation between um, black and white women's organizations. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, are there other resources you would recommend on this subject? Yeah, so on the subject of the Negro building or women's organizations. Let's say both. Okay. <laughs> um, so there are um, like Mary Sewell. I mean, what's interesting about this, there hasn't been as much work done on the Atlanta Fair uh, with regards to um, African American women's activities. Most of the um, kind of work on the Atlanta Fair, um, when it's focused on African Americans, kind of points to Booker T. Washington's speech and kind of limits it with that. So there are. Um, um, and most of the work on African American women has focused on um, the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. And so um, Mary Sewell, um, S-E-W-A-L-L, -L, um, has um, wrote a really um, interesting kind of account of of African American women's efforts to kind of try to create a public presence for themselves at a World's Fair and they were ultimately unsuccessful. And that's part of the reason why this 1895 Negro building is like, people are looking at this as like such a, a huge cue, a coup. Um, Robert Rydell has written about the Chicago um, World's Fair um, because these issues of race, I mean, they've always been there, but they really kind of come to the fore in the 1890s as um, debates about um, disenfranchisement are coming up as, you know, we're getting um, farther away from the, the abolition of slavery and people are really um, in a positive way wanting to see what African Americans have done and in a really kind of crass curiosity way wanting to see how much progress has been made. Um, there's also a book by um, Mabel Wilson that um, it's actually entitled Negro Building um, that looks at the Atlanta Fair, but it also puts um, these kinds of Black exhibitions, she traces it from Atlanta all the way to the National um, African American Museum in Washington, DC. So those are just some titles that kind of talk about fairs in general. Um, with regards to um, books that look at African American women's activity, um, uh, a really good book would be Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's um, Righteous Discontent, which um, looks at African American women organizing in the Black Baptist Church. Um, and she actually coins the term politics of respectability and looks at how these women are, um, these Black women are kind of trying to create a space for themselves and to comport themselves in a particular way, but doing so as a deeply um, kind of deliberate political act. 
to um, kind of to try to create more space for African Americans, but also um, for women. So those are just a few, but there's a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? I was going to make a comment. Hi, Tiffany. This is Shanna. And that was on your last slide when you were talking about the ex-slaves walking through the exhibition among um, other Negroes that had not experienced the same life that they had experienced. What a difference a generation makes, right? Because that was just 30 years from mm -hmm. the close of the war. And um, I think we find that even today, what a difference a generation can make, positive mm -hmm. or negative. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I think that, I mean, there's so many different aspects to this particular, um, this building. I mean, it serves as kind of like a conference center for um, African-American religious leaders and business leaders. And, you know, there's the women's conference. Um, and so there are all of these different groups that it's kind of like the world, the eyes of, of Black America, the eyes of the world are kind of on Atlanta and everybody's trying to figure out how the city, is, the Southern city is going to um, put on a show basically. And African-Americans are really a big part of that. And they're trying to leverage that um, position to secure some benefits for their um, communities. And I mean, I think you see with, um, and I could have gone into much more detail about the ex-slaves, but what's interesting about this particular, um, the fact that these, fair goers are, are going in is that they are, I mean, they're coming in, they're not um, quote unquote well-dressed. Um, many of them are either semi-literate or non-literate, but they also believe that they have a right to that building, right? I mean, you know, it's a building that these elite organizers are saying, this is, you know, emblematic of what African Americans can accomplish um, in just a short amount of time. But these older African Americans are also taking the opportunity to use this space to convene with each other. And, you know, what's interesting about these Black curators is there's real angst about how much to even put about the institution of slavery inside the Negro building. You know, do you just emphasize progress, forward progress, the future, you know, throwing off the shackles of the past? Um, and, you know, and how much do you kind of pay attention to the institution of slavery? And they ultimately decide to just kind of disproportionately um, focus on the future. But there's a real generational um, tension that I find incredibly interesting um, in this in this moment of kind of trying to make sense of what the legacy of slavery is. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blair. We appreciate your time and, and your research and uh, found that it was very fascinating. And we appreciate you uh, sharing that with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, you know, uh, Lauren, do you have other slides to put up? I do. <clears throat> There we go. Um, so thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you, you being here with us and look forward to the next time we can be with you again. Again, uh, you see on our slide here some of our upcoming events, our lecture next week uh, on the 29th. And then on Friday the 30th, we have our next Bartow book break uh, with, with uh, the book Growing Up in Cartersville. It's a, a very popular book right now that we carry in our bookstore. I encourage you to come out and listen to our education team uh, talk about that book. Uh, that'll be on Facebook Live. And then uh, the 5K I mentioned, and then a special event we've got coming up in June, on June 26th, our White Glove event called Summer Evenings, Objects from Those Summer Nights. And that's gonna be an opportunity for you to come to the museum, have a glass of wine with us, and then uh, put on white gloves and, and handle some special artifacts that we have in our collection, all related to, um, to our theme. So I encourage you to come out and be a part of that with us. And uh, I think that's it. And thank you again to Dr. Player. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>